Let's get more on today's market sell-off and what to expect moving forward. We want to welcome in Jim Smigel, SEI CEO. Jim, it's good to see you. Um, how, what do you make of the sell-off that we're seeing today? And is this an appropriate response to that CPI data that we got this morning? Well, hi, Julie, Josh, thanks for having me. Um, I think this is, the, you know, what to make of it is really the market pricing out perfection, because that's certainly what was priced in. I mean, when we look at where we ended 2023, the setup that we had in January, all these normalization cuts, the Fed's going to be able to come in and lower rates just because inflation is going to make its way almost on a linear path back down to the target level. And, you know, we've had the trifecta in recent days. We've had stronger NFP. We've had stronger GDP revisions. GDP now running over 3%. And now finally today with uh, stronger than expected CPI. This is not going to be a linear path. This is going to be a bumpy road. Uh, and I think investors are just trying to take that in and realize, well, what does that mean for rates, for interest rate sensitive sectors and for interest rate sensitive uh, individual names like the ones you were just showing? And Jim, I'm just curious, I was just talking to Julia, if you heard it, there were, there were, listen, plenty of smart strategists, technicians, Jim, who were, who were looking at this rally and say we're due for a, pre, a breather and maybe this CPI print was the catalyst we needed. I'm just curious, Jim, if it makes sense to you here, the kind of pullback we're seeing, or do you think this is a start maybe, Jim, of something more serious for the equity market? Uh, I think it definitely makes sense. I mean, the market was absolutely overbought. There were certain parts, names, sectors that were well overbought. Um, whether this is a harbinger of things to come, uh, that is the start of a bear market, not necessarily. Uh, we wouldn't be surprised, however, if this is kind of the, just the start of the retracement or retrenchment, if you will, in a lot of these really uh, overbought or most loved parts of, of the market. So, uh, you know, the economy is going well, the consumer is holding up pretty well. Earnings season, you know, quite frankly, was, was very, very good. You could say maybe guidance was mixed. We're about 75% through. Uh, earnings season. And I think that's really a kind of a green light for the market. So what we would say is we would look forward to more broader participation uh, from equities kind of going forward. And we would we certainly wouldn't look for uh, what, you know, kind of an echo of what we saw uh, in January with that really, really narrow leadership uh, kind of coming through. The, the challenges, though, are where the yields go from here. If we recall last year when we started creeping uh, a lot closer to 5%, things got into a bit of trouble. So how stubborn is inflation going to be uh, from here? If we do revisit 5% on the 10 year, uh, our outlook could certainly change. And uh, this could turn into a, a sideways to down market from here on out. So you, do you think we'll get to that level though? I think it's quite possible. Um, it's it's something that we've been calling since the end of the, since the end of the year. We saw the risks, the yields of being very symmetrical when I think, you know, the market really was loaded up on one side of, uh, of the boat, that yields were only going to go down from here. Um, you know, the market, as you mentioned earlier in your in your preamble, uh, March is basically off the table. When we look at probabilities, the only thing over 50 percent is June. So first cut now expected in June. And importantly, less than 100 basis points of cuts are now priced in. Uh, uh, Josh, as you mentioned, we're getting closer to the Fed. Fed had three for 2024. The market was closer to six. Now we're getting now we're getting closer to three. But what is it going to take to get there? Uh, I, I don't think the Fed is going to be in in any rush. Um, there's a lot of things going on geopolitically as well, where this could be an even more volatile CPI uh, as we get month after month after month. Goods inflation may be something that we we may be revisiting, quite frankly, with the troubles in, in the Red Sea and the increase in shipping costs. So do I think it's a huge stretch to have ourselves test the 5 percent level uh, on the on the 10 year again? No, I, I, I really don't. I, I think that's definitely within the realm of possibility, certainly more so than what the market is expecting. And, and Jim, I just want to you know, look at the major averages here. NASDAQ's down 2.3%. Jim, I'm just curious to get your take on, on tech specifically, Jim, because listen, you get a hot CPI print, rates higher for longer. You know, that's, that's not great news for you know, high multiple names, Jim. It, it certainly shouldn't be. I mean, this is just how discounted cash flows work, right? When we're expecting um, you know, long durated cash flows out uh, into infinity and we have interest rates rise, when we discount those back, that should produce a lower net present value. So we tend to agree now as it relates to the Magnificent Seven, that always hasn't been the relationship that has held. Uh, so we certainly want to recognize that. 
Um, but that concentration in the first part of this year has been pretty extreme. I mean, I think we all know the numbers. NVIDIA is up 45% on a, on a year-to-date basis, and we haven't even seen earnings yet. That's a big, that's a, that's a big release that everyone's waiting for for next week. Uh, but directly to your point, we we would expect if the economy settles in, uh, if inflation doesn't reaccelerate, even if it's stubborn, we would expect broader participation here. Uh, so what does that mean? Value stocks is something that we like and we are leaning back into and leaning away from the growth names. That's going to lead us to sectors like financials and energy and materials. Uh, so, you know, the, the this overhang of the potential for higher rates uh, that is something that is, you know, it goes and it goes into our calculus and it has us liking, liking value, liking financials, liking energy right here. Um, let's dig into energy a minute um, in particular. And, you know, value has been unloved for a while and we get people periodically come on to say we like value and it just hasn't quite broken out. Right. Growth has continued to be the winner. Um, what is going to change, particularly when we talk about energy here, because there, those companies have been making a lot of big moves in terms of consolidation, but we have not really seen the stocks be rewarded. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, one caveat on value, 2022 was a phenomenal year uh, uh, for value. So, well, although you're you're certainly right, if we look back 10 to 15 years, it has not been a great time. This has definitely uh, been a time period of overactive monetary policy and growth names have rolled the roost. Uh, as it relates specifically to energy, you know, a lot of this comes down to supply and demand. Uh, if we have an economy that it's holding its own, which it certainly looks like it is here in the United States, we have the potential for increased Chinese stimulus uh, coming uh, from that part of the world, another major economy that's been very, very disappointing, potentially coming back online. And then we still have uh, kind of uh, cuts in production coming from the likes of Russia and coming from the likes of Saudi Arabia in April. So if the demand side can hold up and the supply side is going to continue to be constrained, that in and of itself, and that's just ignoring the geopolitical situations that we have uh, in multiple parts of the world right now, that alone can be a, a bit of a, of a tailwind for higher energy prices this year. Jim, it was great to have you helping us kick off the show today. Thanks so much for your time and insight. Thank you both.